this program is brought to you in partnership with CU Maurice River. CU Maurice River is dedicated to protecting the watershed of Maurice Water River and the region known as Down Jersey, thereby enabling current and future generations to enjoy the environmental, recreational, cultural, and scenic resources of this wild and scenic global treasure. I'd also like to share our Wheat and Green initiative, which is created in partnership with CU Maurice River. Wheat and Green is an overarching initiative implemented by Wheat and Arts over a decade ago, which continues to inform our operating principles and our goal to become a sustainable organization, practically and artfully. In addition to defining a new level of best practice in our daily operations, facility planning, and goals for program relevancy, Wheat and Green reflects a commitment to participate to participate as an environmental steward of our community. Examples of special projects include demonstration rain garden, an annual eco fair, the construction of vernal pools and our other habitat restoration projects. Our most recent success has been transforming an extant railroad to a nature trail, celebrating art nature in the Maurice River watershed in partnership with CUMR. Be on the lookout for our partnership as it's growing in 2021 with CU, MR, and Wheaton Arts with the help of the communities who will be installing a large eco-friendly project with the support of National Fish and Wildlife. And we're now going to play a video made by CU, MR staff members, Carla Rossini and Megan Thompson, who will be introducing Pat Sutton. Please adjust the volume of your device if necessary. Good evening and welcome to my name is Carla Rossini, and I am the program manager at Citizens United to protect the Morris River. And is that good? Yes. It's Aries, also known as CU Morris River. Behind the camera, we have Megan Thompson, who is CU Morris River's assistant office manager. CU Morris River is a conservation organization that focuses its efforts on preserving the natural and cultural resources of the region known as Down Jersey. We are also a National Park Service partnership organization that works to implement the goals and objectives of the River Management Plan for the wild and scenic Morris River. CU Morris River is a conservation organization, not a gardening organization, so you might ask yourself, why do we offer so many opportunities to learn about wildlife gardening? Well, in his book, Dr. Tallamy tells us that 80% of the lands in the United States are privately owned, which means there is a conservation opportunity there if we leave the traditional ways of landscaping, which includes falling lawns and the use of fertilizers and pesticides and basically the removing of all type of beneficial habitat for uh, fauna. In tonight's presentation, from Pat, you're going to learn about the life cycle and habitats and habits of pollinators and their importance and also their uniqueness between species. Tomorrow, if you join us for the virtual garden tour, she'll teach you how you can start using your space to support these species. But also, how you can convert your outdoor living space into maybe an urban oasis or stop over for migrating pollinators and birds. Or even if we get enough people together, the link between green spaces. A few years back, CU Morris River started a watershed stewards program. One facet of that program is education. So we lead workshops that help uh, stewards get initiatives uh, in the ground at their homes. Uh, we have led rain barrel construction workshops, we've done bee nursery workshops, germination workshops, and many, many others. If you're interested in more information on the different stewardship opportunities that we offer, you can visit our online calendar at www.cmorrisriver.org. Another facet of this program is designation, where you can see the sign right behind me is one of our wildlife designations. And what you would do to become designated is download uh, you can go to cumorrisriver.org again and download a checklist. Fill out that checklist. And if you get the necessary, the required points, we would love to give you a designation plaque so you can start working as a leader for stewardship 
within your community. Say you fill out the checklist and you didn't get enough points. Send it in to us anyway. We'll review it and give you a call. We can go over it together and we will see how we can help get more initiatives in at your property. Tonight, it is our joint pleasure to bring you Pat Sutton's How to Spot a Butterfly presentation. Pat Sutton began her career as a naturalist at Cape May Point State Park. She then went to New Jersey Audubon's Cape May Bird Observatory, where she worked as a naturalist and program director for 21 years. Pat now is a freelance writer, a photographer, a naturalist, educator, lecturer, tour leader, and wildlife habitat conservation gardening educator. Pat has co-authored with her husband a series of books um, being Birds and Birding at Cape May, How to Spot Butterflies, How to Spot Hawks and Eagles, How to Spot an Owl. We'd like to thank Pat Sutton for taking her presentation and garden tour virtually. She's been a pioneer in South Jersey, educating on the, benefit, on the conservation benefits of wildlife gardening. And we feel fortunate to have her as a longtime partner, a member, and a friend at CU. With that, Pat, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you for everything you do for us and the next generation of stewards. Thank you, Carl. Yeah. Lovely. Yes. All right. I will get the program started. Happiness is a butterfly in my garden. And of course, as a keen naturalist, happiness is all wildlife attracted to my garden. Here, a slaty skimmer. Many of these were taken in my garden and you can believe they put a smile on my face, like this dark tiger swallowtail on a stand of Turk's cap lily, or this juniper hair streak on cutleaf coneflower, or this monarch on Mexican sunflower, or a group of migrating monarchs on seaside goldenrod in the dunes at Cape May Point or this white M hair streak and the Alanthus webworm moth on cutleaf coneflower. Another tiger swallowtail on Turk's cap lily. And Marcy, you have our first poll question for folks who've joined us. I do. It's, do you have a butterfly garden? And it's up now. We're getting some results. Okay. So should I pause for a bit, Marcy, before continuing? If you'd like to go on to the next slide, it's up to you. Or we are at 71% right now voting and climbing. Okay. Wait, 10 more seconds? Sure. Okay, I'll end the polling and share the results. Can you see that? I, I can. 79% have butterfly garden and 21% do not. All right. Well, until fairly recently, butterfly study has only been done with the use of a net and a killing jar. And in butterfly collecting, the perfect specimen was carefully pinned and mounted, usually along with dozens of others, possessed. Oh, I don't seem to be continuing. Let's see. I might have to start over. I think what that did was um, kind of stop my computer from advancing the images. Maybe if you just click um, with your mouse in the middle of the image. I'll try that. Okay, there we go. Thanks. You're welcome. 
So in butterfly collecting, the perfect specimen was carefully pinned and mounted along with dozens of others, possessed, but seldom watched. Butterfly watching as opposed to collecting first became popular in the 1980s, and that's long after bird watching caught on. Our book on watching butterflies was published in 1999, and butterfly watching has been revolutionized by modern close focus binoculars. Also, close focus macro lenses for cameras now enable observers to document butterfly occurrences without collecting them. And national groups like the North American Butterfly Association, often referred to as NABA, have linked butterfly watchers together all across the country. Butterfly watching can be either as arduous or as relaxing as you wish. You can travel many miles to a special butterfly hotspot like the Southwest and once there, visit specialized habitats like Aravipa Canyon in Arizona, an arid area concentrating butterflies along river edges where nectar flourishes. Or the high Arctic tundra to witness the brief but rich butterfly season there. Or you can look for a weedy field or unmowed road shoulder full of nectar and enjoy an assortment of butterflies concentrated there by that nectar. We're like Bob Pyle, author of the National Audubon Field Guide to North American Butterflies, Chasing Monarchs and many other terrific books. You can walk forest trails edging an Atlantic white cedar swamp in May and hope to see the rare Hessel's hair streak. As a gang of us did successfully in May of 2008, when Bob Pyle was working on his latest book, Mariposa Road, about his big year tracking down as many butterflies as possible in the US. Or if you don't care to head out in search of butterflies, you can try to lure them to you by planting a garden brimming over with key nectar plants all season long. There are 722 species of butterflies found in the US and Canada, of which 145 have been found in New Jersey, of which 110 can be found here in South Jersey. And the first butterflies to catch our eye are often the large and showy species like this zebra swallowtail. But actually, many butterflies are much tinier than the large swallowtails. Here, a palamede swallowtail and a skipper in the foreground called a whirlabout. So you can see how many small butterflies might be easily overlooked. Understanding a bit more about them will open your eyes to a world of butterflies surrounding you. Butterflies and moths are related. Both are soft-bodied insects with scaled wings. Millions of closely packed, socketed scales like overlapping shingles on a roof give a butterfly and moth its glorious colors. Butterflies differ considerably from moths, even though they may appear very similar to the eye. Butterflies have thin antenna that swell at the tip, club-like, they are active during the day, and they are normally brightly colored. This one's a painted lady. Moths are active only at night, so they're rarely seen unless you go to the effort to see them as Dustin Welch has here with his moth setup of lights to lure them in and sheets lit up by the lights for them to land on and be photographed. We saw this male imperial moth on July 27th during one of his moth nights. Moths have feathery antenna which taper to a tip, to the point. But moths and butterflies use their antenna for smelling, but moths probably use them to a greater degree to find food and mates in the dark of the night where butterflies probably use vision to a greater degree since they're active during the day. In general, moths have hairier bodies than butterflies and are less showy 
not as brightly colored as butterflies, though there are exceptions to each of these differences, as you've seen, by the imperial moth in the last image and by this moth, a luna moth. There's nothing dull about either one. If you're interested in butterflies, you now know that there are 722 species to learn in the US and Canada. Compare that to 11,000 plus moths. Moths outnumber butterfly species 14 to one. Lucky for you, there are two new field guides for moths this one that covers the Northeast and was published in 2012, and one covering the Southeast that was published more recently. In South Jersey, I find that I'm using both of these field guides. There's an overlap. Prior to these books, the Old Moth Field Guide had gone out of print and was illustrated with black and white photos of dead specimens which made ID just about impossible. If you garden for butterflies, you're likely to attract the day flying moth, the snowberry clearwing, and the hummingbird clearwing. Each of these are sometimes mistaken for hummingbirds. Butterflies only live for several weeks, some species for only a few days. When newly emerged, Every scale and their colors are beautiful and the wings are perfect. This is a pearl crescent. Over the course of a butterfly's brief life, the scales protecting the wings are slowly lost, some to predators, some to spider webs, and some to weather. Many slough off as wind whips branches and leaves around knocking foliage into roosting or nectaring butterflies, or as rain strikes a butterfly. If you handle a butterfly, the powdery residue on your hands is the scales from their wings. A tattered butterfly is often referred to as a rag by butterflyers, as in ragged, and probably has but a few days or maybe even a few hours yet to live. Quite a difference from the way they look when newly emerged and only a day or two old. An adult butterfly's purpose in life is to mate, lay eggs, create that next generation and die. So the next time you see a black swallowtail floating among wildflowers or passing through your garden, Keep in mind that it's probably not the same individual you saw a month ago, but part of the next generation, and it too will die after mating and laying eggs on suitable plants. This pair is about to mate. Butterflies and the plants they need for egg laying, known as the caterpillar food plants or host plants, are a crucial combination. The female black swallowtail will lay her eggs on any member of the parsley family, parsley, dill, fennel, Queen Anne's lace, rue. The egg is many times smaller than the head of a pin. A tiny caterpillar hatches from the egg. It is an eating machine feeding on its host plant and growing larger and larger. The caterpillar stage of a butterfly's life is when the butterfly does all its growing. As the caterpillar grows too large for its skin, it sheds it and the new soft skin hardens, a process which will occur several times. These stages are known as instars and the caterpillar can look very different in each instar. For example, a young first instar black swallowtail is black with a white saddle, like you see here, a cryptic pattern that resembles a bird dropping a camouflage to protect it from predators. Later, black swallowtail instars look entirely different in color and pattern, as you can see. Growing to full size normally takes the caterpillar around two to three weeks. Then the caterpillar spins a silken thread, attaching itself to a safe site. 
The caterpillar then slowly metamorphoses into the pupa. The outer surface of this pupa or chrysalis hardens and the butterfly slowly develops inside. About two to three weeks later, the newly formed butterfly will flex its way out of the chrysalis and emerge as an adult butterfly. Initially, the wings are crumpled. The butterfly pumps fluid into the crumpled wings until they expand or stretch out to their full size. After several hours, the wings dry and the butterfly can now fly. Every scale is fresh and perfect, and it is fun to realize that when you see a perfectly intact, bright and beautiful butterfly, it has probably just recently emerged from its chrysalis. It will grow no larger, but its appearance may change as scales are worn or lost and it begins to fade. In some cases, the female and male look quite different. Here, a female black swallow tail, and here, a male with his yellow markings in the wing. Now, when you find a caterpillar, you can look it up in one of these two excellent field guides to the caterpillars of butterflies and moths. In parts of the US and Canada, where true winter occurs, some butterflies have only one generation or are single brooded, like the Henry's Elfin, a butterfly seen only in the spring. The adult emerges from the chrysalis in the early spring, only lives a week or two, mates, lays eggs, and dies. So if you don't go looking for these spring specialties, you'll never see them. And the elfins fly before our gardens are in bloom. So one looks for them on sandy roads. This one appeared while working in my spring garden on April 15th. And just to show you how tiny elfins are, here is a pine elfin on my finger on April 3rd. I feared a car would run over it, so I had it climb up on my finger and moved it to a safer spot, since it was resting in the road. Others, like the tiger swallowtail, have multiple broods and might be enjoyed spring through fall. But now you know that you are looking at different individuals, different generations, not the same individual from spring through fall. In the high mountains and in the Arctic, where summer is a brief two months at most, some Arctic species, such as the banded alpine, are on the wing only every other year. And how can one explain that? It's because it takes two full years for their caterpillar to develop since the Arctic summers are so brief. Some butterflies can lay their eggs on a number of caterpillar plants. The gray hair streak is one of the commonest and most widely distributed butterflies in North America because it uses so many different plants to lay its eggs on. Butterfly field guides generally list known caterpillar food plants or host plants. For rarer species, a knowledge of the host plant and how to identify it is essential for finding the butterfly. We had never seen a Baltimore checker spot in New Jersey until early one June when we came upon white turtle head, its only host plant, while hiking through a bog in the highlands. We made a point of returning to the turtle head stand in late June the only known flight period for this single brooded species, and bingo. We enjoyed a dozen spectacular, freshly emerged Baltimore checker spots. So in order to find certain butterflies, you have to be a bit of a botanist. Locally, juniper hair streaks are never far from their host plant, red cedar. Their tiny caterpillar looks a lot like red cedar needles, so is incredibly camouflaged. Mannington Marsh in Salem County supports a population of the rare bronze copper. A stunning little butterfly 
we found them nectaring on a nondescript wildflower that most would pull out as a weed, dogbane. Their host plant is water dock and sometimes the very common curled dock. When we find passion vine in South Carolina, we often find the beautiful Gulf fritillary, since this is the plant they lay their eggs on. And taking a close look at the passion vine often means finding Gulf fritillary caterpillars. And if we're real lucky, we spot their chrysalis on a nearby plant. So camouflaged and so beautiful, truly a work of art. So as you can see, it is quite fun to learn plants and habitat types through the butterflies. In southern coastal salt marshes, do not expect to see eastern pygmy blues unless you see glasswort, their only host plant. During the butterfly counts that I've run in South Carolina for the past 27 years, we walk through patches of glasswort on the salt marsh looking for these tiny gems. Moving on to another aspect of butterfly biology, adult butterflies drink sugary nectar from flowers with a long, coiled, extendable, and retractable tongue-like proboscis. Butterflies and moths pollinate flowering plants by carrying pollen from plant to plant on their wings, as you can see here, with this tiger swallowtail covered in orange pollen from these Turk cap, Turk's cap lilies. And here a dark female tiger swallowtail, also quite orange from pollen. They also carry pollen from plant to plant on their proboscis, their legs, and their feet. And butterflies and moths are also extremely beneficial pollinators of fruits and other crops. The length of a butterfly's proboscis does determine which flowers it can nectar on. Deep tubular flowers attract butterflies with an extremely long proboscis, like swallowtails and skippers. This skipper is called a sachem. Typically, butterflies that are attracted to sap and rotting fruit have a short proboscis, like this question mark. Huddling is another interesting butterfly behavior. Many species, and particularly the males, congregate at damp, sandy spots, puddle edges, seeps, and pond edges. These congregations are often referred to as mud puddle parties. Here they drink, but also ingest important nutrients and salts that they need. Some species seem to be gregarious, where at times you will have dozens of the same species puddling together, like these little yellows. Other times you may find a mix of species. The early Lepidopterists were nearly all men, and before setting out into the wilderness in search of butterflies, they would urinate near their vehicle. And upon returning to the spot, they'd often find the ground covered with butterflies. When we come upon puddle parties, it's often a sign that an animal urinated there. How butterflies spend the winter is key information. Most species winter over in either the egg, the caterpillar, or the chrysalis stage. You might own or have considered buying a butterfly house. They're cute and pretty, but they are really just a money-making gimmick. Since there are only three species of butterflies in our area that winter as an adult butterfly, and only those three species may use this butterfly house. These three species are more likely to crawl down inside a hollow tree, and you can see how this tree would have provided a safe haven in winter. Sadly, it was cut down, the three species that winter as adults may crawl down into your wood pile under shutters or shingles. So we created our butterfly house from fallen trees and old fence posts and placed roof shingles in between each layer of logs 
to keep the weather out. Lynn Tarvis found two morning cloaks wintering in her shed, one hanging low down on the door, and here's a close up of it. Some of these overwintering morning cloaks don't fare so well, what with spiders and other creepy crawlies in their chosen winter nook. So the three species that winter as adult butterflies include the morning cloak, the eastern comma, here showing its bright coloration on top, and the silvery comma underneath, which gives it the name eastern comma, and the question mark, told from the comma by the comma and dot mark on the underside of the wing. But over 90 species of butterflies that winter here do so as an egg, a caterpillar, or a chrysalis. Most of the swallowtails winter over as a chrysalis. This is a tiger swallowtail chrysalis on our tulip tree. Just getting a sip of water. <clears throat> the adult tiger swallowtail emerges from that chrysalis in the spring. Many butterflies survive the winter in the caterpillar stage. This is true of the red spotted purple. After mating in late summer, early fall, they lay their eggs on black cherry and beech plum. The caterpillar hatches, feeds and grows, but as temperatures begin to drop, the partially grown caterpillar creates a safe place to spend the winter, known as a hibernaculum, here on September 26th. It silks the leaf shut to create the hibernaculum and silks the leaf to the tree or shrub so it will not fall to the ground. And here on October 23rd, you can see that the leaf has turned brown, the partially grown caterpillar is sleeping inside, and the only leaves left on the tree or shrub on December 17th are hibernaculums. All others have fallen to the ground. These remain because the caterpillar silked the leaf to the tree. If winter has been kind, the hibernaculum is still intact in spring, here on April 17th. And on warm spring days, the partially grown caterpillar ventures out in search of food so it can continue to grow. And here on May 6th, the shrub has leafed out and the caterpillar has food to eat. But when we get cold springs and the leaves are delayed, this can really impact butterfly populations. Some species of butterflies survive by migrating south in the fall to warmer climates where they can spend the winter safely in the adult stage, like the common buckeye, which journeys from New Jersey south to the Carolinas and further south for the winter. Some falls, the common buckeye migration at Cape May rivals that of monarchs. The monarch makes the most dramatic migration of all, emptying out of southern Canada and all of the eastern U.S. and traveling thousands of miles to forested mountaintop roosts in central Mexico. But a bit more about migration later. A great many predators feed on butterflies at every stage of their life cycle. Birds are one of the primary predators of butterfly and moth caterpillars, gleaning tiny and large caterpillars from leaves. But don't let this alarm you. It's why we're not overrun with butterflies and moths. It's really all part of the natural balance. Truly, butterfly and moth caterpillars sustain our birds, and it is what they feed their young. Doug Tallamy's editorials and wonderful books have opened our eyes to just how many caterpillars birds need to raise a nest full of young. For instance, one pair of chickadees bring 300 to 570 caterpillars to the nest each day depending on how many young they have in their nest. They feed their young for 16 to 18 days before the young can fly. So to raise one batch of young, 
a pair of chickadees must find an incredible 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars. So for a healthy bird population, we need a healthy butterfly and moth population. And for a healthy butterfly and moth population, there needs to be a healthy landscape of native plants. We had a most amazing treat when a pair of prothonotary warblers chose to nest in a wren roosting basket on our front porch. The hungry young begged to be fed. Mom bought, brought billful after billful of caterpillars, as did Pop. And we've gardened with native plants, the plants needed for egg laying by our butterflies and moths. So our yard was like a supermarket to these beautiful warblers. And they successfully raised young in our yard for two years. One of my personal highlights from a trip to Alaska in June of 2017 was watching a white crowned sparrow take this bill full of caterpillars back to her nest of hungry young. So native plants and the caterpillars that these plants support sustain birds. It's all woven together. Beyond birds, many insects prey on butterflies, including dragonflies, here in eastern pond hawk with a skipper. And a common green dorner that successfully snared a migrating monarch. Spiders take their toll too, here a garden spider with a cloudless sulfur. And crab spiders wait in ambush on flower heads for an unsuspecting butterfly to land and nectar. Just taking another sip. Lynx spiders in the south haunt nectar plants favored by butterflies and bees. And don't be surprised to find that there is a world of predators out there, especially where butterflies and other pollinators are concentrated, like our gardens. This green anole is using its camouflage to blend in, hoping for one more tasty snack. Even frogs, like this green frog, are opportunistic hunters and will take a butterfly if it lands on a flower leaning low over a pond. We have often found a praying mantis in our garden by first noticing a pile of monarch wings on the ground below it. Where the praying mantis has been laying in wait for its next victim. In most cases, we let the natural order of things play out, but we've learned that many of the praying mantises are the non-native Chinese mantis. So in the winter months, when it's easy to spot the Chinese mantid's distinctive round egg case, I collect every one I find, dig a shallow grave, and bury them so that the 100 to 200 young won't have a chance to emerge in the spring. Sadly, the Chinese mantis is so common because of the popularity of buying mantises to take care of garden pests better thing to do would be to let nature take care of it all on its own without our help. And believe it or not, natural predators will find and tackle problem insects like aphids. And the non-native chi Chinese mantis egg case is very distinctive looking. Where our native mantis, the Carolina mantis, their egg case looks quite different. So when you find these, leave them alone that Chinese mantis is preying on our native Carolina mantises. So they're already struggling. Butterflies have evolved many strategies to avoid predators. Some butterflies have eye spots on their wings. These spots are thought to cause some predators or birds to pause, thinking that they are about to attack a much larger and more formidable opponent. But a second theory, perhaps better, is that predators aim for the eye spots when trying to grab a butterfly, but only get a piece of wing and the head of the prey they think they caught, they haven't caught at all. 
Some butterflies have tails, which are actually protrusions from the wings, thought to look like or imitate antenna. Many hair streaks rub their hind wings back and forth so that predators aim for the false head and only get a piece of wing. A butterfly missing a chunk of wing escapes relatively unscathed. As long as the butterfly body remains intact, it can still mate, lay eggs, and create the next generation, the primary purpose of the adult stage. Cryptic coloration is another way that many butterflies avoid predators. Even some of the brightly patterned butterflies like the Red Admiral, a blaze of color when its wings are spread, but when it closes the wings, it is remarkably camouflaged. Mimicry, where one butterfly's pattern mimics another is used by some species like the Viceroy. Its similarity to the unpalatable monarch, which is distasteful to birds because of the caterpillar's diet of eating milkweed leaves, is the best known example of mimicry. The monarch does not have the cross vein. You'll only find the cross vein on viceroys. An understanding of basic butterfly behavior is essential for the butterfly watcher. Butterflies are cold blooded. Their body temperature depends on the surrounding air temperature. Most cannot fly until temperatures warm up to 55 or 60 degrees Fahrenheit. So for butterfly watchers in the north, we're quite eager for winter to be over and a late winter, early spring day with temperatures above 54 degrees means butterflies are possible. This spring, Azure greeted us in Southern New Jersey on February 27th one year. They're tiny, as you can see here compared to a cross pen. And if you don't see it, this arrow may help. Spring azures are found in the early, early spring when there is little to no nectar. They perch on sandy roads, warming up as the sand warms. Their name comes from their azure blue coloring on top of the wings, which you can only see when they're in flight because they nearly always perch with the wings closed. So you can imagine how I, excited I was when this spring azure landed with its wings open. In the late winter and early spring, when these butterflies are flying, the only nectar available is blooming red maple trees. So also be looking up into red maples for them. In order to fly, butterflies need to warm up their thoracic muscles, which control their wings, and to warm their thorax or their body, they commonly bask. And basking or sunbathing can quickly raise the body temperature. Some butterflies sunbathe with their wings fully open to expose the full wing surface towards the sun. But if the sun gets too hot, the butterfly may close its wings so it does not warm up too much just as it would close the wings if a cloud passes over so as not to lose too much body heat. And if cloud cover becomes real serious, butterflies seem to disappear. They really are sun worshipers. During an overcast condition, they'll simply perch down in vegetation out of sight because they're quite vulnerable. They truly can't fly if they're not warm enough. Many butterfly species are sedentary, never straying far from the habitat where their caterpillar food plant grows. And this is true of the emperors. The hackberry emperor seen here and the tawny emperor are found only where hackberry trees grow. Lakehurst bog, famous for its rare plants and butterflies. And a few other pine barren bogs are the few places in New Jersey where Georgia satyr can be seen, a disjunct population well north of their normal range. Other butterflies are highly migratory, like the painted lady. Adult painted ladies cannot survive northern winters and retreat in the fall to the southwest U.S. and Mexican deserts. 
In spring and early summer, they surged north, repopulating the U.S. Fall 2012, big numbers of painted ladies migrated south through the Cape May Peninsula. Many nectared in our garden along the way. So many, in fact, that one of our leopard frogs left the pond and took up a station on the sedum bed to snack on them. Opportunistic little bugger. Red admirals also migrate south each fall and repopulate our area each spring. Hundreds of northbound red admirals were all over the Cape May count all over Cape May County on May 4th one year, nectaring on blooming black cherry. In the West, American snouts are known for their dramatic mass immigrations, also called eruptions, and some years very few are seen north of their permanent range. Other years, millions upon millions move north, and there are reports of them darkening the sky and motorists having to pull over because so many snouts were smeared on the windshield that they couldn't see to drive. In late summer, some southern butterflies perform a one-way migration north, and in the northeast, we eagerly, eagerly await these southern wanderers, like this long-tailed skipper. These immigrations, which means leaving one area to migrate, usually follow good breeding seasons to the south, and it has been theorized that the adult butterflies may be reacting to an overpopulation and stressed food resources, either nectar or the caterpillar plant. Southern species fly north to eventually die, however. There's no corresponding southbound migration known for these southern wanderers. They may rear a breed far to the north of their normal range, but they and their offspring are eventually doomed by falling temperatures. These movements are unpredictable, some years involving none, dozens, or hundreds of individuals. This is a big year for cloudless sulfur, another southern wanderer. This huge sulfur is the size of a monarch. Some years we see many in late summer and fall, and this is one of those years. Partridge pea is their host plant, and I have lots of it in my garden. And because of that, cloudless sulfurs are daily visitors in my garden, mating and laying eggs on my partridge pea. Their caterpillar is very camouflaged, and their chrysalis is a work of art. If you're new to butterfly watching, there are now many priceless tools of the trade. Many regional books are available for areas around the US, Canada, and Mexico that will alert you to good butterfly watching spots and also offer excellent site-specific natural history information like local host plants, nectar plants, flight periods, distribution. And since I took this photograph, Jeffrey Glassberg's Butterflies Through Binocular series has expanded to also include the West and Florida and the Kaufman and Brock Guide to Butterflies of North America is now available. And Glassberg's second edition of the Swift Guide to Butterflies of North America includes many Mexican species that wander north into Texas. And if you travel south into Mexico and beyond, Glassberg's Swift Guide to the Butterflies of Mexico and Central America and Kim Garwood the butterflies of Northeast Mexico will allow you to ID what you see. We use Glassberg's book in Costa Rica and Belize as well. And I can't tell you how lucky you are to have all of these resources. When I began watching butterflies, books were very few. In fact, our first trip to Veracruz, Mexico in 2002, we made up our own names for the butterflies that we found there. Dave Sibley was on the trip and he and I named this one the Oriental Rug Hair Streak. Finally, when field guides were written about Mexico's butterflies, we learned that it wasn't a hair streak at all, 
but a metal mark known as the carousing jewel mark. Well, in 2009, on our last trip to Veracruz, Mexico, we saw the carousing jewel mark again, and what a treat. With all these wonderful field guides and close focus binoculars, butterfly watching has taken birders by storm. But some people still fight it. For butterfly watching, you want a pair of binoculars that focus on objects five or six feet away, or at least seven to eight feet, not 12 to 15 feet away. Because if you have something like that, you're having to back up to focus because often a butterfly will be spotted as it comes in and lands literally at your feet. And today's great cameras enable you to capture photos of a rarity that you found or to document something unusual that you've noticed, like these spring azures feeding on a bird dropping. And here's the photo documentation. Even a point and shoot digital camera can capture stellar images. With reasonably priced digital cameras, it's become easier and easier to get high quality images. You wanna take advantage of the many opportunities to see and learn about butterflies, go out with the experts whenever walks or talks are offered. And for several years, I led tours at the Texas Butterfly Festival, which is held in early November when butterflying here in South Jersey is pretty much done. I can highly recommend this festival. There are lots of field trips visiting the many preserves in the area, and you will not believe the numbers of butterflies. Staggering numbers and diversity. Thousands upon thousands of queens, which are related to monarchs, there is a great map to all the bird and butterfly hotspots and great butterfly books to the area. And who can resist blue butterflies, like this Mexican blue wing, or this blue metal mark, or this silver emperor, silver banded hair streak. And if you're at all interested in butterflies, I highly recommend joining the North American Butterfly Association. This is the group that organizes all the butterfly counts across the nation. There are 22 NABA chapters around the country, including a North Jersey chapter, and many of the chapters have excellent websites linked to the NABA website. This is the North Jersey chapters website. Their species accounts are highly educational, showing the life cycle, great photos, seasonality, caterpillar plants, and more. And NABA has two excellent publications. American Butterflies is highly educational. I read it cover to cover and always learn something new. And their second publication, Butterfly Gardener, often includes pieces written by chapter members around the country. I'm gonna take another sip of water. And every other year, NABA holds a members meeting somewhere neat. Clay and I have attended as many of these NABA members meetings as possible. The 2008 meeting was in the Kern River Valley in California, where field trips took us to mountaintop meadows covered in blooming wildflowers and butterflies. Of course, some of the field trips included time with the giant sequoias. NABA's 2014 members meeting was in Chattanooga, Tennessee, where we were taken to meadows of blooming butterfly weed. Wouldn't you love to see that here in New Jersey, a field full of butterfly weed? And our target species was the Diana fritillary, a forested mountain species with scattered populations. And Clay and I had only seen them once before. And it was an added treat to see them nectaring on white milkweed. NABA's 2016 members meeting was in the Rio Grande Valley of Texas, 
coupled with the Texas Butterfly Festival. And their next meeting will be next August in Santa Fe, New Mexico, if COVID allows it. It was to be this year. To learn butterflies and have easy opportunities to study them, seriously think about creating gardens on your own property. Marcy, do you have our second poll question? I sure do. And that one, oops, let me get to the next question and here we are. And that is, do you have a butterfly bush? If so, how many? That while they're polling, um, I thought I'd ask you a question and give your voice a rest. Um, are any of the images, or did you include any of the images from this presentation in your book, How to Spot a Butterfly? Uh, since the book was published 21 years ago, oh, <laughs> we were not digital then, and I have a billion slides that I took and uh, scanned a lot of them when I put together this show. But since then, with digital photography, I've probably replaced a lot of the old photos that I took. Wonderful. It's just beautiful. We're about well, at 48% now. It's pretty cool that I can just step out the door to take many of these photos in the garden. Yes, and that's what's going to be exciting about tomorrow's mm -hmm. part two. Well, we're, we're holding at 48%. So if you'd like, I'll go ahead and end that and share the results. Okay. And can yep. you see that? It looks like 56% have one butterfly bush, 40% have two to four, and 4% 4 have five or more. Very interesting. Okay. Thanks for that, answering that, everybody. So as you learn about, um, if you want to learn more about butterfly gardening, obviously tomorrow's uh, presentation will be a big help, but also uh, on my website, Gardening for Pollinators, this post has a link to a three page handout packed with well-honed truths about gardening for pollinators, and it includes chocolate cake nectar plants month by month, which is quite a challenge, having something in bloom constantly. And there and I did include your link on the web, on the chat, in the chat. Great, thank you, Marcy. And the handout also includes a wealth of certification and signage to showcase your efforts with neighbors, friends, family, and coworkers, including CU Morris Rivers stream friendly and wildlife friendly certification and signage. It's fun to head off to Good Nectar and see what you can find and persistence really rewards the watcher. Many times over the years, we have puzzled over a nectar patch devoid of butterflies yet returned a few days later to find it full of butterflies. There's an excellent book, uh, Butterfly Gardening in the South, which explains how nectar production is affected by so many things like temperature, wind, humidity, day length, sunlight, a plant's health, and how each plant's reaction to these conditions varies. Good nectar production often results from a cool night followed by a clear, hot day or mild, warm winds after a rain. Strong cold winds may shut down nectar production. The sun's warmth increases nectar production, so wildflowers and gardens in open, sunny spots offer the most nectar 
and that nectar may become even more abundant and more concentrated at midday. Butterfly gardens concentrate nectar and act as magnets to butterflies, especially if these gardens are near or include weedy areas and native trees, shrubs, and vines that are critical for egg laying. Truly plant it and they will come. Our own wildlife garden has given us so much pleasure over the last 43 years and pulled in 77 different butterfly species. We have the second highest yard list for butterflies in New Jersey. Put some fruit out in your garden and attract additional species. And I used to purchase fruit and let it rot and then take it out for the butterflies. And I realized that the farm stand where I get my produce was throwing out rotten fruit. So now they humor me and they let me bring a spackle bucket, empty of course, which I can fill up with all the fruit they're ready to just toss out into a field. So here I am squishing up some of the, the day's fruit and there's one butterfly that just couldn't wait. You can see it on my hand, a question mark. It just couldn't wait, it was so hungry. We have three dishes of gooey fruit that we maintain in our yard. This one's hung from a shepherd's hook. And beyond nectar, keep in mind some of the odd behaviors when searching for butterflies, like the fact that they'll be attracted to animal droppings for amino acids, proteins, and organics. These are common alpine and a Hoffman's checker spot on bare scat. Once you spot a butterfly, move towards it low and slow. They have compound eyes, which easily detect movement. So the simple act of pointing to a butterfly may flush it. If you're with a group, a quick explanation of how to point out a butterfly saves a great deal of frustration later on, and will often do it with the first or second butterfly of a walk. Then when everyone's had a great look, we give the okay for photographers to inch in closer. Of the 722 species of butterflies found in the US and Canada, they can generally be divided into seven separate groups or families. There are about 31 species of swallowtails found in the US and Canada. Here, a spicebush swallowtail. Poppers, hair streaks, and blues are the next family. This is a very large family of very tiny butterflies. In fact, the Western Pygmy Blue is the world's smallest butterfly. The great purple hair streak is in this family. It eluded us for years until we went to Southeast Arizona and got to see lots of them. And now when we do our butterfly counts in South Carolina, we look forward to seeing them there as well and we've enjoyed them in Texas also. And this is a butterfly that uses mistletoe as its caterpillar plant. Other members of the hair streak and blue family to look for once cutleaf coneflower blooms include red banded hair streak, and here's a close up, juniper hair streak, Eastern tailed blue, and summer azure. The metal mark family is highly diverse and most are found in the neotropics. 181 metal marks can be found in Mexico, like this blue metal mark. There are 23 metal marks in the US, including only three in the east. We journeyed up to Sussex County to see the one metal mark found in New Jersey, the northern metal mark. The next family, the whites and sulfurs, include about 50 species here in orange sulfur. Cloudless sulfurs are in this family also, and the cabbage white, native to Europe, but now a common butterfly all over the US. 
Each spring, we eagerly await the brief flight of falcate orange tips, another member of this family. The brush-footed butterflies make up the largest and most diverse family of butterflies. Here, one of the rarest, the regal fritillary. The brush-footed butterfly family includes crescents. Here, a pearl crescent. It includes the question marks and the commas and question mark from below and from above, Eastern comma from below. Brush-footed family includes the American lady with the blurred eye spots along the trailing edge of the hind wing, it includes the painted lady with the distinct eye spots on the trailing edge of the hind wing, red admiral, common buckeye, red spotted purple, which are attracted to my fruit dish. Emperors are in the brush-footed butterfly family. Here, a hackberry emperor and a tawny emperor. And the satyrs were once considered a separate family, but today are lumped with the brushfoots. Most are medium-sized butterflies with soft brown coloration. Many lay their eggs on grasses, including this Appalachian brown, and they too are drawn to my fruit dish and common wood nymphs. Next, the skipper family includes 270 species in the US and Canada. Many are very confusing. A few have distinct patterns that can help with ID, like this male Zabulon skipper, bright yellow with a rusty thumb print area near the body, and the female Zabulon looking like a different species and here a pair of Zabulon skippers. The skippers are divided into two groups. The spread wing skippers, like this one, a hayhurst scallop wing, and the folded wing skippers that look kind of like little helicopters with one set of wings up and one set of wings flat. But most skippers are like this little brown job on my hat and might be best left to last if you're new to butterfly watching. Not called skippers for nothing, maybe best to just skip them if you're a new butterfly watcher. But if you do want to tackle the skippers, here are, are a few easy to ID ones that we're seeing right now. Silver spotted skipper, Horace's dusky wing, Sachem with that chevron pattern in the wing, broad wing skipper, they're huge, and very variable, and salt marsh skipper with the pale ray and elongated wing. One last group of butterflies is a subfamily of the brushfoots, known as the milkweed butterflies. They're mostly tropical with about 200 species. Only three are found in the US, and the most common of the three is the monarch. All use milkweed as their host plant and monarchs make the most amazing migration of any butterfly known. For many falls, thousands upon thousands migrated through the Cape May Peninsula. This was the fall of 2010, September 18th and 19th, when half a million monarchs passed through. During days with good flights, evening roosts can hold hundreds or thousands of monarchs, and we're all hoping to see something like this again. Thousands of migrating monarchs are caught and wing tagged at Cape May each fall. And the tag has helped researchers piece together the amazing journey that these butterflies make from all over the US and Southern Canada, heading south in the fall to mountain fir forests in central Mexico where they winter by the millions in the mountains of central Mexico. And by the first warm day in February, they begin mating. And by the second week in March, they begin migrating north, laying eggs on milkweed as they head north. Their children and grandchildren are the ones who arrive in New Jersey sometime in April and May. Fascinating travels for such a delicate and fragile creature. If you garden for butterflies, 
may your milkweed patch be stripped and may you have the opportunity to move your excess monarch caterpillars dozens each day to a robust robust stand of common milkweed as i did the fall of 2009. we need to do everything we can to help pollinators begin by planting native plants support native plant nurseries and on my website i maintain a list of reputable native plant nurseries that covers this region, New Jersey, Eastern Pennsylvania, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, and I update it regularly. And while you're shopping for native plants, use Doug Tallamy's list of the top 40 plants needed by butterflies and moths for egg laying to create the next generation you'll see that asters and goldenrods are at the top of the list. And notice I haven't used a single photo of butterflies on butterfly bush. It's something that a lot of people plug in thinking that they're covering the bases. But as you've watched this program, you realize now, hopefully, that there's a lot more to butterfly gardening than a butterfly bush. This bush is native to China, it is invasive, and what it's providing to nectaring butterflies is nectar only. It's kind of like a candy bar. None of our butterflies or moths can lay their eggs on it, unlike so many of our key native nectar plants, which not only provide nectar, but they also serve as caterpillar plants. So, all the pollinators that come into these butterfly bushes, think about how far they have to journey to find the caterpillar plant that they need to create the next generation. That's why gardening with native plants is so important. And I'm realizing, Marcy, that our poll question did not include zero. And that might be why we had a number of people that didn't reply because they might not have butterfly bush in their garden. I believe you're correct. <laughs> I had it, but I removed all of mine so I could have room for more and more native plants. So Marcy, do you have our third poll question? Yes, I do. And it is, will you be joining Citizens United Morris River and Pat Sutton tomorrow night for Pat's virtual tour? If you haven't signed up, you still can. And I have already shared the link in the chat. So um, you can click on that there. Okay, so and I'll share those results. Okie doke, super. We look like we have 82% that can join us tomorrow. Cool. I look forward to seeing you all there. Thank you. So back to spotting butterflies, head out to a nectar rich area and find a whole new world opened up to you. Mind you, it might be hot and it might be buggy, but I see a smile on Chris Williams' face, despite the discomfort of heat and biting mosquitoes. Playing the numbers game, you can enjoy 722 butterflies in all of the US and, <clears throat> and Canada, like this malachite, which occurs in South Florida and South Texas. Here in New Jersey, there's 140 species to look for and enjoy, and 110 of those occur here in South Jersey, like this one, the salt marsh skipper, which only occurs along the coast because its caterpillar plant grows in coastal salt marshes. If you live in one of the southern eight counties, Ocean, Burlington, Camden, Atlantic, Gloucester, Salem, Cumberland, and Cape May, 
You can report your sightings and monitor sightings made by others on the South Jersey Butterfly blog. And you can also, as you can see, submit photographs. If you live in one of the northern 13 counties, you can report your sightings and monitor sightings made by others on the North Jersey Butterflies website. <clears throat> and if you live outside New Jersey, report your sightings and monitor sightings made by others on NABA's recent sightings site, which covers the entire country. And when you travel, a wealth of additional butterflies might be found to excite and delight you. Our trips to Veracruz, Mexico were over the top with butterflies, like this rusty tipped page, Anna's 88, body eye mark. Butterflies are nature's jewels. I invite you to open your eyes, your hearts, and your gardens to them. They are pretty out of this world spectacular. And I think I am happiest when I'm out butterflying. Camera and binoculars at the ready, wandering an area rich in wildflowers and nectar where my chances are best. I hope this program has opened your eyes to the delights of spotting butterflies and the happiness and joy and peace it can bring to your life as it has mine. If you have any additional questions, you can reach me through my website. And when you're there, you can join my gardening gang for regular gardening and nature tips, alerts about native plant sales and other helpful wildlife gardening news by clicking on the top link or the link further down the page, join Pat's gardening gang. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pat. I'm going to go back to sharing our screen. And okay. um, I believe that um, uh, Sarah has some questions for you now. Super. That was so fun, Pat. Thank and you, I Sarah. love your photos. Thank you. Great pleasure. Seeing and documenting. It's a lot of fun. Oh, they're beautiful. Let's see. So there's a number of questions in both the Q&A and the chat about okay. the fruit dish that you put out in your mm -hmm. garden. So mm -hmm. have you had any problems with the fruit dishes in the garden attracting flies or other um, critters, rodents, raccoons? That is a, a definite concern. Does the fruit dish attract unwanted insects? And initially, um, I was concerned about that too, but now I see the fruit dish as such a bonanza. Um, I elevate them so that they don't get covered with ants. If you put it on the ground, the ants will be all over it. So I have them hanging from a shepherd's hook or an elevated uh, stand. And there is the occasional wasp in there. Yes, there are flies, but <clears throat> that does not keep the butterflies from coming in. And the fruit flies pull in hungry hummingbirds. Okay. <laughs> which eat the fruit flies. So it works itself out. <laughs> it does. And you don't want the goo seeping out. So okay. Dish without holes in it. Okay. And it does kind of get funky and old if it gets rained on. So I probably put new fruit out every three or so days. Gotcha. Okay. Let's see. Um, another question. Should I worry about the small milkweed bug on my swamp milkweed? Do they eat monarch eggs or caterpillars? A lot of people are concerned about the other critters they find on their milkweed. And I often recommend to them a terrific little book called Milkweed, Monarchs, and More. And there is a second large edition of that book. And it's for kids, it's a picture book. So it has incredible photographs and natural history information about everything that needs milkweed. So the milkweed bugs can only live on milkweed. 
So yes, we love our monarchs, but we can't start eliminating all these other creatures that also have to live on milkweed. So see it as this wonderful um, habitat. It's a whole world of critters that depend on milkweed. And that book, Milkweed Monarchs and More, will educate you about all the fun critters like milkweed bugs and milkweed beetles that also need to live on milkweed. So they, they're part of the package. Okay. And then I'll go to the top. First question, why does urine attract butterflies? Good question. Why does urine attract butterflies? Um, butterflies are getting uh, amino acids and um, nutrients from male urine. So if a lot of male animals will stake their claim to an area by urinating on the perim perimeter of their turf, and it's places like that that draw in male butterflies that are then drinking from these moist areas and getting some amino acids and nutrients from the male urine from insects or in the early days from male lepidopterus. Okay. So apparently female urine does not have anything in it that butterflies benefit from. So, okay. Yeah. It's gender specific. It is. <laughs> Good thunk? to know. <laughs> Let's see. Um, if butterflies live only a few days, how do monarchs make that trip? Well, when I generalized about butterflies and their life cycles, um, there are some species that only live a few days, but you now know how many species, over 700 species in the US and Canada. So some of those species only live a few days. Monarchs are quite unique in that there are different life cycles for different generations of monarchs. So the monarch in the summer months that you see in your garden, they live about five weeks. And during that five week period, a female and a male find each other, they mate, and then she lays her eggs trying to disperse them. She doesn't wanna lay her eggs all in one place. So I have seen a female wander my garden, lay eggs, and then venture out into the neighborhood looking for other places to lay her eggs, not finding them sadly in my neighbor's yards, so coming back to my yard. So through the summer months, we have four or more generations of monarchs, each of them living about five weeks. Then the monarch that we see that migrates through, that individual lives longer and they can live longer. So that generation, the migrating generation, can live up to nine months because they're not mating. Instead, they're migrating. So they're in what's called sexual diapause. And instead they've chosen to migrate. They're heading to the mountains of Mexico. They get there, they spend the winter there, and it's not until late February that they mate. Now when they've mated, they've got to hurry up and the females have to migrate north because now that she's mated, she's going to die fairly soon. So now the, the migration period, she has to go quickly, lays her eggs on the Gulf Coast states of Louisiana, Alabama, Texas, Florida. She dies and those eggs hatch, the caterpillars feed, and about a month plus later, you've got the first generation from the overwintering generation and they go further north. So it's kind of a leapfrog of generations north till they get up to Canada. No other butterfly does what the monarch does. I mean, it's so confusing <laughs> that people are puzzled by them. So hopefully that helped understand monarchs a little bit. I think it did. Let's see. Um... Another question. In the past, I opened a gypsy moth web and put them on a BB nesting, but I think, yeah, nesting box. Good idea or not? 
Uh, I'm just, I didn't really follow the question. BB, is that Bluebird? Um, if yeah. someone's wondering about playing God and putting caterpillars <laughs> in birds, I think you want to kind of take a hands off. Um, and gypsy moth caterpillars are prey for some birds, as are tent caterpillars. Right now we're seeing fall web worms. Uh, those nets or webs of caterpillars, they're fall webworm, full of fall webworm caterpillars. There are certain birds which will feed on them, but you can't really be the judge of who, which birds will do that. Uh, certain birds find them palatable, others don't. So yeah, we don't want to play God. Just what we do want to do is not assume that a web is a bad thing and cut the tree down or burn the web or, you know, poison the web of caterpillars. We want to leave it there for the birds to find naturally and take advantage of, which they will. Okay. Um, what do ashers feed on if there aren't any plants? Red maples? What do azures feed on? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. In the springtime, a lot of the uh, butterflies that have one generation that we only see in the springtime, the only thing they have to turn to is often red maples when they bloom, but also um, our society wages war on dandelion. Dandelions are not native, but dandelions are a great nectar source. So I certainly don't poison dandelions in my yard. I welcome them. And in my lawn, which is not a gorgeous, lush, monoculture green lawn, it is a mix of clover and grass and crabgrass and weeds, but a lot of the butterflies nectar on the clover when it's in flower. So in spring, things like clover, things like dandelion, and certainly red maples in bloom are all playing a big role. We used to have clover in our yard too. Yeah. Our grandfather came over the big sack and <laughs> can't yeah. get rid of it. Let's see. Well, you want it because it is um, fixing nitrogen and your grass will be happier. But the landscapers don't want you to have clover because then they can charge you for fertilizer. Okay. But if you have the clover, you don't need the fertilizer. <laughs> so to get away from all that chemical stuff, chemical fertilizer, just, yeah, cast out clover. It's a wonderful thing to have in your lawn. Okay. Um, hi, Pat. This is from Steve Mason. Miss hey, you and Clay. <laughs> Could you talk about some memorable experiences butterfly watching has brought you that didn't include butterflies? Ooh. Wow that didn't include butterflies. Oh, well, butterflies are one excuse to get outdoors, one of many. Uh, as a naturalist, I love wildflowers and dragonflies and robber flies and frogs and tadpoles and you name it. Um, so whatever I see energizes me and connects me with the natural world. And I was uh, just sharing with a person an experience I had with Steve Mason and harvesters, which he'll remember. We found these butterflies that uh, you don't see them nectaring. They're, you can't count on seeing them. You can't go to a field full of nectar and, and see harvesters. We found them on a wet road and Steve and myself and Jack and Jesse Connor just laid on this wet road for hours photographing these harvesters. So that's, that's a very wonderful memory I have. Okay. Mud and harvesters. Here's another question from Marsha and Leroy Tab. Can you put a very ripe banana on the hanging butterfly platform with the peels or without just the peels? I see some people who have a butterfly dish that put the peels of bananas in it. Um, I tend to, um, if bananas are, bananas are great to pull in butterflies in a fruit dish, like I set out. 
And often what I'll do is uh, freeze, peel the banana, freeze it, and then as I need to put fruit out, if I can't get fruit from the fruit stand, I'll put out bananas that I've frozen and they're instantly mushy and delicious, uh, according to all the butterflies that come into them. So I, I don't think the peel is necessary. Okay. Um, why do monarch caterpillars turn black and die? <clears throat> there are a number of um, things that can affect monarch caterpillars. There are predators that will suck them dry. So you might end up with a shriveled monarch caterpillar that has been feasted upon by a spined soldier beetle. Uh, and also there is something called OE, which affects monarchs. And uh, it's uh, carried by spores. So if a monarch has OE spores on it, it can be a carrier. Come into your garden, nectar on a flower, and rub some OE spores or off on the flowers in your garden. And a healthy monarch can land there and get the OE on it. It's very complex to explain. So what I recommend is that people Google OE as one word, OE, and monarchs, and you will get to a number of educational sites uh, with Monarch Watch, Journey North, they explain OE and being aware of it, especially if you raise monarchs as an educator. You do not want OE in your terrarium making monarchs sick, but they can, the chrysalis can look black and very unhappy. Okay. The monarch will not emerge from it. Okay, here's a question from Suzanne Morigi. Should we remove the large pods that have formed in our Aslepius tuberosa butterfly weed? I heard this would encourage more flowering. I hope I pronounced it correctly. <laughs> yes, good, good pronunciation there. Oh, okay. good. Um, so yes, milkweed, Asclepius is the Latin name for milkweed, and butterfly weed is a milkweed. It's the one with orange flowers, and I tried what you suggested this year. I've never done it before. I've always let my butterfly weed flower and it flowers in late June, early July. Then where the flowers were, it develops a seed pod. And I don't really need the seeds. Lots of nurseries carry it. So I did cut off the developing seed pod. And right now my butterfly weeds are blooming for a second time. So it's definitely something to um, try in your garden so you can have nectar longer on milkweed. Okay, awesome. And then Dolores Amesbury is asking, how long after mating do females lay eggs? Hmm, yes, good question, Dolores. Um, I think with some butterflies, it's quite soon after uh, mating that they can lay eggs. I remember reading a lot about that with monarchs and I'm a little fuzzy. I'd have to, you know, dive back into my research to determine how long it is. But I, I've seen monarchs mating in my garden and they'll fly around in tandem. And sometimes at dark, they're still together. And the next day there's a female monarch laying eggs. So, you know, probably it's not very long at all. Okay. Um, another gypsy moth question. Won't gypsy moth webs end up defoliating the tree so it shouldn't be removed? Uh, gypsy moths were a big issue here in Cape May County uh, for a number of years and a lot of spraying was done and I lived in an area where they did not spray which I was grateful for. And some of the trees were so stressed by the constantly feeding gypsy moths that the trees died, but it, many of the trees survived it. They were strong 
And what happened was the gypsy moths ate themselves out of house and home. They stripped the trees of leaves and they had nothing left to eat. So the gypsy moths naturally took care of themselves without um, chemicals being used, which, you know, you'd like to think that something being sprayed for gypsy moths will target only gypsy moth caterpillars, but truly any spray is going to affect other caterpillars as well. So um, you want to try to avoid that at all cost. But here in South Jersey, I've not seen gypsy moths in a long time. I don't know if you're thinking about fall webworms, which right now we do tend to see, and those don't kill the tree. Okay, let's see. Um, I used to have clover, but now I have a lot of hop clover in my lawn. Is it beneficial? Yes, I have seen butterflies nectaring on hop clover, but you can easily uh, spread some more clover in your grass just by getting some seed at a feed store. They often carry a number of different clover seeds that you can buy by the ounce or the pound. Okay, and then here's a ladybug question from Evan Schumer. Do ladybugs make pupa like butterflies? Um, lady, yeah, a lot of insects go through a life cycle, um, just like the monarch, the butterflies go through a life cycle, and the ladybug larvae are often mistaken as bad bugs. So, um, it's important to be aware of the ladybug's life, uh, life cycle and make sure you're not squishing something you think is a bad bug. It might be a ladybug larva, and the ladybug larva um, also eats aphids. So the adult ladybug is a big predator of aphids, as is their early life stage. And I have a great book that shows the life cycle of many garden insects. Let me just get it. <laughs> okay. I don't know if people can see this. I guess not. Um, it's called Garden Insects of North America, The Ultimate Guide to Backyard Bugs. And it's a great book that has uh, the whole life cycle of all the fun insects that you tend to find in your garden. Oh, that's cool. It is cool. <laughs> okay, I have one, we're out of questions, but there's um, your friend Steve Mason wants to chime in on the gypsy moth conversation. Yes. And he's very knowledgeable. That's okay, awesome. Then I want to give him a platform. I could be wrong, but I don't think gypsy moths even make webs. So if you're seeing webs, I'm betting they are native tent caterpillars or web worm caterpillars. Yes, indeed. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, Steve. And there's lots of them. So it's pretty fascinating to watch. Ichneumon wasps are known for doing that. And that's kind of fun to watch in your garden to realize that these ichneumon wasps are an important predator of some of our problematic um, caterpillars that are pest crops, um, pest insects with crops. Thanks for asking that. That's a good question. Yeah. And probably everyone has seen them on their um, tomato hornworms on their tomato plants in their garden, which have these little pop-up things on the back. Those are the wasp uh, cocoons before the young wasp that's been eating the, the caterpillar alive is ready to emerge as an adult wasp. Great questions. Thank you so much. One day I've seen that happen to a catalpa thinks caterpillar. Oh my goodness. <laughs> we become very attached to our caterpillars, don't we? Mm -hmm. Karen Schoeder. <laughs> I'm going to share the screen again so that people can contact you or 
go visit your website and contact you. And um, once again, talk about tomorrow night. Um, did you did you want to wrap it up, Pat, or do you have a few things to share? We have a little bit of time left. Um, the questions have been terrific. I guess if there's uh, any additional questions and then tomorrow we'll certainly build on a lot of this information, uh, seeing uh, our garden as it's unfolded with everything that we've learned about wildlife and trying to benefit wildlife with that garden. We can't wait for it. And I, I hope I didn't offend anyone with the butterfly bush question. I had them in my garden for many years and deadheaded them so they wouldn't spread. But realizing that I needed more room for more and more native plants so that butterflies had all the plant material they needed for egg laying, I really don't miss them. It, my garden is entirely uh, mostly native plants now and I really don't miss those butterfly bushes. So. It's been fun, fun transition. Oh, there's one last question that just popped up. Ed Marsh just asked, since tulip trees are in the magnolia family, are they deer resistant? <clears throat> I do not know if tulip trees are deer resistant. I, do, I did plant a tulip tree because tiger swallowtails lay their eggs on it. And they're doing that to this day. And I planted the tree many, many years ago. It's now taller than our house. And I can no longer see the caterpillars because the tree is so big. But we had dogs and we fenced our yard to keep the dogs from straying. And that over the years served as a deer fence. So I was pretty spoiled and when we protected our woods and got invasive plants out, the deer were in there immediately. And we put netting around the woods. So we have an entirely deer-proofed yard with fencing. I don't know that I could garden um, if I didn't have the fence for deer control. Well, thank you again, Pat. Um, I want to just say it was just such a wonderful evening and the, the photography is just spectacular. Um, I'm always inspired, but um, they're by, the, by your talks, um, particularly today, there's such an intimacy um, with this kind of setting and I hope you enjoyed it and I hope everyone enjoyed it as much. Um, the chat room is, is definitely um, thanking you for this evening and we're looking forward to tomorrow evening as well. Um, I just wanted to thank Carla Rossini and Megan Thompson again for all their, their efforts in putting this together and Citizens United, Marsh River and my co-host Sarah and um, Oh, there she is. So you can contact Sarah at slc at wheatonarts.org as well. Um, and one more reminder that if you want to find that special clay that you enter R-U-G-A um, in the search bar um, and um, remind you that you are also not just supporting Wheat and Arts, but you're supporting those artists and even the the busy bee NJ, the, the bee rescue and honey. Um, so add a bit of sweetness to your purchase by adding busy bee New Jersey honey to your order. And it's this week only. Um, whether you choose shipping or curbside pickup, you are going to get that free eco bag. And um, everyone, if you would like to drop me a line to hear about other or tell me about other programs you'd like to see Wheat and Arts produced. I'd love to hear from you. I will, will also provide you with the chat, um, a copy of this chat, uh, if you'd like to, just to easily reference. Pat, I did include um, as many as uh, the links as possible and try to keep up. You're just such a wealth of knowledge and um, I, I, I did my best. But um, as Pat said, um, contact her as well. And um, I just wanna say thanks and good night all. Thanks for having me and great, great questions and great opportunity to share 
information about butterflies. They're all around us and we can help them be plentiful. Yes. See you tomorrow night. See you tomorrow. Till then. <laughs>